Hello, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of Contours, the Cambridge Literary Studies Hour. My name is Atu Kwesin, and I am Professor of English and Chair of the Department of African and African American Studies at Stanford University. I will be the host of each episode. Each episode of Contours will address a pressing issue, theme, or concept in 21st century literary studies. In many of these episodes, I will be hosting a dialogue with an author or authors from the Cambridge University Press List. Others will feature a panel of experts in the field, and I will introduce those episodes as well. We aim to provide an invigorating, accessible forum for critical debate and reflection to engage and help students, teachers, and general readers. Contours will range from medieval literature to the present day, from all areas of global literary studies in the Northern and Southern hemispheres. Each episode will be approximately an hour long and will be available via YouTube on our new Contours page on Cambridge Core. We are joined for today's episode by Fabrice Leroy, Professor of French and Francophone Studies at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. Ugo, Hugo Fry, Professor of Visual and Cultural History at the University of Chichester in the United Kingdom. Martha Coleman, Professor of Comparative Literature in the Department of History, Literature and Art at Bryant University. And Maheen Ahmed, who is an Associate Professor of Comparative Literature at Ghent University in Belgium. Today we will be discussing the Cambridge Companion to the American Graphic Novel, edited by Jan, ba Jan Bartens, Hugo Fry, and Fabrice Leroy. The Cambridge Companion to Comics, edited by Maheen Ahmed, and the Cambridge Studies in Graphic Narrative Series, which is edited by Jan Bartens and Martha Coleman. We hope you find this episode of Contours, the Cambridge Literary Studies Hour useful, enjoyable and relevant, and more importantly, that you be encouraged to join us again in the next edition. So ladies, and gentlemen, I have a few uh, uh, questions, but before I get into the questions, I'd like to invite each of you to say something about your specific uh, books uh, and indeed the series. So I want to start with uh, Martha, Martha Coleman. If you could tell us something about uh, the Cambridge Studies in Graphic uh, Narrative Series, the rationale and so on. Thank you, Otto, and thank you for inviting us to speak about this exciting series. The Cambridge Studies in Graphic Narratives is a, a very dynamic new line that we've developed at Cambridge, and I'm very excited because I think it builds on uh, a large foundation now of academic work on comics. And so we seek out the best and the brightest with new ideas, and uh, have just this year, or I would say last year, published two volumes, The Rise of the Graphic Novel by Alexander Dunst and Drawing from the Margins by Benoit Crucifix. And both of these are terrific uh, books that are just beginning to get reviews in. Yes, Drawing from the Archives. So it's a tremendous privilege to be working with these authors and to be scouting talent for new voices in uh, comics and graphic novel criticism. Excellent, wonderful, wonderful. And um, I want to uh, pose uh, the same question to the Cambridge Companion to the American Graphic Novel. Uh, uh, Hugo Fry. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me and pleased to meet you, Atto. Uh, OK, so uh, maybe four or five years ago, we were thinking about a project to do 
that would be something different, but something also very central. And while there have been a lot of texts on the graphic novel, they tend to have been focusing on, yes, the importance of the US, but in a kind of global uh, literary context. And, you know, given the, the centrality of text and image popular culture in America and its effect on, on high culture as well, it, it was somewhat glaring that there isn't a specific text that combines uh, questions of what is America and, and what is the graphic novel. And so the project was to recontextualize the graphic novel in, in the exclusive setting of the US. And that means looking at a long history of adult graphic narrative from the uh, early 20th century through, uh, in this case, actually a, a more contemporary feel to the work, uh, looking at what graphic novels do today and how they reflect back to readers uh, different visions of, of what it means to be uh, American. So I co-edited it with uh, Jan Batens and Fabrice, and the book is uh, composed of a series of thematic uh, chapters that take on uh, genres of graphic narrative and explore what they have to say ab uh, about America, I think. That was what we hoped to do, uh, and I'm very happy with how it's come out. Fabrice, have I mis-summarized Fabrice. every intention of our project? <laughs> yeah, Fabrice, actually, let me ask Fabrice another question. It's a follow-up, but but will allow you to to expand on, on what uh, Hugo has just said. Uh, reading the introduction to your volume, I got the sense, and I'm completely, I'm sure I'm completely wrong, that the graphic novel is birthed in America. Is that right? Or it has a more global, global, you know, provenance. But America is the instance that you are interested. This is basically my question. Yes, we were reflecting on on the history of the term. You know, when cartoonists and practitioners started using the term in in the late 1970s, and how they wanted to differentiate what they were doing from earlier comics, which tended to be more serialized in format and didn't have this this full narrative arc that the graphic novel tends to have. Uh, so there were there was a reimagining of how you can publish comics and how you can have them as standalone volumes published in bookstores instead of the, the usual way of, of of publishing comics in the US. The, the other traditions, of course, have had their importance, and and we've uh, we've we're very conscious what happens in Europe at the same time. You know, France has and French language comics have their own history with the gra with graphic narratives, um, and perhaps there was an earlier consciousness in France of. The potential for comics to turn into something closer to to literature with certain magazines with the 1970s and even the late 1960s so it's it's a global phenomenon our interest was mostly um american centered and uh, we we're trying to look at, at the early stages of of the, this new phenomenon we were looking at predecessors and precursors you know, very early text that could be connected historically to a genealogy of the, the form of the graphic novel, things that were published in as early as the 1930s. Uh, Livio Bello has an excellent article on uh, Milgross's uh, woodcut novels, for instance, um, or 1950s even. Uh, so we're looking at earlier forms, and we're also looking at the transition between uh, between comics, different subgenres of comics and graphic novels. So some superhero comics were starting to develop longer longer story arcs, longer stories, more complex themes, um, and so there's a gradual transition from that into the world of the graphic novel. So we had a, a historical approach to this, uh, but also we had a thematic approach. We were trying to see what what subgenres of the graphic novel exist. What what were the contributions of of autobiography or or auto ethnography to to the graphic novel? So we tried to create a, a full historical landscape as well as um, as a thematic landscape for the graphic novel. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. So Mahin, the Cambridge Companion to comics. <laughs> Tell us about that. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Because I actually don't have a copy. I read the, the intro electronically. So thank you. Please uh, show our readers that it actually, it exists. Yes. They exist. Yes, please tell us about that. <laughs> Yes, yes, thank you for having me. So, um, 
Yeah, the aim behind the Cambridge Companion to Comics was to sort of look at comics as a medium from a broader perspective, as broad a perspective as possible within 17 chapters, let's say. It's um it's divided into three three parts. So forms, readings, uses. The first part looks at different forms that comics can take or different material elements of comics. So it ranges from digital comics and manga to drawing to looking at the emergence of the graphic novel to situating comics in a broader media, a dynamic media culture. The second part, the longest one, looks at readings, which combines different approaches to interpreting comics, understanding them, ranging from genres, comics adaptations, life writing, but also comics at the limit of narration, so abstract comics and poetry comics. And it also tackles issues such as racism in comics and the representation of women in comics. And the third part looks at uh, turns to uses or how comics um, unfold in our everyday life, let's say in the everyday sphere. So comics in libraries, comics in the museum, comics in the educational sphere, how they used to teach multimodal, lear multimodal learning, for instance, um, comics in the archives, and com which includes comics archives and how comics deal with their own archives and reader memories of comics. So it's it's really trying to give a whole, but also concise picture of the medium of comics and its diverse manifestations and um, presence, let's say. Mm, 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 wonderful. So I have a burning question, and it's the question of an, a complete ignoramus, which is, what is the difference between comics and graphic novels? And I'm thinking specifically of two that I'm from manga. So manga versus mouse. What what are the differences between comics and uh, graphic novels? Taking manga versus mouse, and uh, uh, please, and this is open to all. Maybe starting with with uh, Mahin since you last spoke. Yeah, um, so <laughs> definitions are always tricky. They're, they're a good starting point, but there's a moment when they will always break, right? But a manga is, well, manga is a very, very broad term, and it's it, it, just, rep it just designates Japanese comics, right? So different kinds of forms, be, be it magazines, digests, but also graphic novel form, <laughs> right? Yeah. And mouse is, well, it's... It's a, it's a it's in a book form. So I, I guess one way of approaching this very um, tricky question is to think in terms of forms and medium. So you can think of comics as a medium combining words and or usually combining words and images. You also have wordless comics, for instance, right? And within that medium, you have different forms. You have the newspaper strip, you have um, serialized comics, um, and you have the graphic novel for which, of which Mouse is per probably the best known example. Mm. Okay. How about um, um, uh, Fabrice? What do you make of that? Um, well, I do think the publishing format had a lot to do with uh, a, a different consciousness of, of what the medium could, could do. Uh, and the, the standalone uh, book format uh, that can be shelved among a collection of, of other books, for instance, uh, had a lot to do with people's perception that this was no longer a, a disposable object, was something something to be to be trashed after reading, but something that had some permanence to it, some 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 weight, uh, some some artistic value to this. I think also the the author's consciousness of. Uh, of being part of a new movement, of, of defining their work differently, uh, had a lot to do with that as well. And so when the graphic novel term was not available to some early practitioners, they may have been doing something very close to, to what graphic novels tend to do today, but without that that institutional understanding of, of their own practice. Uh, so, you know, I, I think um, practitioners have a, a central role to play in, in defining what they do, um, and also the whole publishing world kind of shifted to a new way of, of presenting these works, uh, giving them more validity, giving them more more recognition, more artistic value. 
um, and then bookstores starting also displaying them differently. And I think once these these books entered mainstream bookstores and no longer these these very specialized comics um, bookstores that you know tend to be mocked a little bit in American popular culture. You know, we tend to see them as, you know, a place where, where young nerdy men look at superhero comics and um, it, it wasn't quite uh, the, the same artistic uh, prestige as as being part of a, of a bookstore and being shelved next to a book of art history or, 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 or another form of novel. So all these elements, I think, play a part in how we, we consider the medium and how we give it value. Mm. How about Hugo? What, what, do you, what do you have to... Yeah, I think there are, I pick up on some of Fabrice's points and mine's and then make some new ones. So I think the term graphic novel is very helpful in America for, uh, around questions of status of text mm -hmm. and image narration. And so if you if you think about it back to the sort of late 40s and 1950s, you, you have the infamous comic scare where comics are, are seen as part of a moral panic and uh, being burnt in schoolyards and, you know, considered cause of crime and delinquency. And the comics industry in a, some ways goes, uh, has to has to find a, a legitimate space for itself. And in the 60s, uh, that appears through, you know, quite elaborate sci-fi stories uh, emerging and then, you know, some pop, uh, pop star stuff of the, the Batman series of, of the 60s. And then we arrive in the 70s and the new generation who are, who are coming out of underground comics, very much DIY, uh, countercultural stuff, that, that bubble has kind of burst. And yet creative people like Art Spiegelman uh, want to find formats to do serious things with, uh, with text and image like mouse. And the word graphic novel becomes useful to kind of capture that status change. Now, now for somebody like Spiegelman, that's... Uh, that's not something he's totally enamored with because he sees that as a kind of betrayal of the, you know, solid tradition of, you know, great American comic books and sees it as a kind of flip uh, marketing term. But, you know, nevertheless, you know, his publishers, his readers, uh, the generation of graphic novelists afterwards, like uh, Joe Sacco and Alison Bechdel and, you know, many others that uh, you could mention that the term starts to become uh, really useful to uh, legitimate this kind of format. The, the second point would be that in, in that new space, there are some technical differences that, that emerge. Now, they're not true all of the time in every example, and you can always find examples that won't fit what I'm about to say. But, but generally, uh, a key differential then is is the end of serialization. So, you know, I've got some old comics in the office here. And, you know, the pictures look great, but if you start reading 60s American war comics, you know, the cover looks exciting, but the stories, they're all the same. You know, we know roughly there's a, there's a hyper genre storytelling and it's just repeated and repeated and repeated because, you know, the kids want to go and buy the same stories every week or, the parents want to read them in the newspaper every week. And to be a graphic novelist is almost the opposite of that. You know, it's one person's vision. It's one story that's got a clear beginning, middle and end. And so, you know, many people can draw G.I. Joe. Many people can draw Batman. You know, any of us could go and work for DC tomorrow and do a decent Batman story because we know but we can't do, you know, only only each of us can do our own graphic novel. So that that's where it moves to being a little bit more like uh, the, the traditional novel and, you know, current creative writing practice in that it's a it's a single story coming from a single vision. And mm. it's it's finite. Uh, you know, Mouse has its number of parts, it has its various publication editions, but but there isn't Mouse part 55. I see. And so yeah. that, that would be what I'd want to underline to, to sort of pick up the debate. Yeah. Thank you very much. Martha, I'm, I'm coming to you for, in a minute. Uh, so what, what I'm, I'm, I'm gathering, this is just as I'm listening, is the difference between the, because the serialized uh, format of the comic, which you saw, for example, in newspapers, I grew up with some of them, uh, which uh, you know my father read before leaving for work. Uh, the repetitive and completely predictable nature of it 
is also an assurance that the world is okay in the sense that because you can predict what the world is because you've read the the news is always crazy but the comic strip gives you exactly the same features it's repetitive and so whereas the the graphic novel is a different thing it does not um, obey it's not predictable it is finite and so on and so forth this is just me trying to reorganize what you said but martha coleman uh, yours is a series on graphic narratives so tell us about graphic narratives thank you this was exactly the point i wanted to make and so there's one distinction that hasn't been brought up yet that i want to introduce now and that is the notion that a novel is not true right it's fiction and we wanted it to be much broader than that so we said graphic narrative and I think uh, Mouse is a case in point because it was published in 1986. It was a bestseller and it was a bestseller on the fiction side. So Art Spiegelman himself at the time, uh, you know, wrote a letter to the editor saying it was misclassified basically. And one could very quickly understand why, because this is him interviewing his father about his father's experiences during the Holocaust. Now, surely you don't want to say that these Holocaust recollections are fiction. Um, above and beyond that, something that we see, and this makes graphic novel a little bit tricky, is that graphic memoir and autobiography are some of the strongest, I would say, um, subgenres within the graphic novel. And those are not fiction in the same way that, you know, crime and punishment is fiction. Of course, there's always some uh, alterations and so forth. Um, Linda Barry famously talks about this, like some aspects of this autobiography are going to be switched and changed but it's still an authentic experience and this is part of what makes it moving right is that it's someone's recounted experience and how they're representing it therefore graphic narrative is broader and i have in fact changed the title of the course i teach from the graphic novel to graphic narrative to accommodate that change mm, thank you thank you so much the um of course i have several questions the um there's a character in uh, juno diaz's uh brief wondrous life of oscar wow the wow character he reads lots of um what i think are comics now that i'm thinking now that i'm getting a, a wee sense of the difference he reads lots of uh, sci-fi comics but his reading of the sci-fi comics is part of a, a wide, um, you know, ecosystem. So he also plays a lot of video games. He's obsessed with video games. He reads sci-fi comics, and then he he writes his own narratives in which he is the hero, the superhero. So I want to ask a question coupling two different things. One is the principle of intermediality. Which, which is mentioned in, in the American, uh, the, the, the uh, Hugo Fry and Fabrice Leroy, your, your, the American graphic novel, you mention it. And I think, um, Mahin, you also mentioned intermediality. But I want to connect intermediality, or I'm inviting you to connect intermediality to the ecosystem in which these um, various images, drawings circulate and reappear they re they reemerge in different contexts. Uh, the best example is, of course, the the MCU, the Marvel Universe. Mm -hmm. You know, there are Marvel toys. That when you go to to New York uh, City Times Square, you see a Marvel, <laughs> you know, uh, boot villain and and uh, and superhero in Times Square soliciting for arms and so on. What do you think of the intermediality and in overall ecosystem in which different elements keep echoing each other so that it's part of an entire cultural envelope, a way of thinking, feeling, and seeing? What, what, do, you, what, what do you think? 
Let's start with uh, Hugo. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd, I'd agree. It's a fascinating aspect. And um, it kind of is testimony to the, the power of popular images and text and image storytelling and the characters that people, you know, become fascinated with and, and track. So I'd say probably two two things to, to get the ball rolling. I mean, that that kind of uh, uh, intermediality is 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 been a strong feature of uh, American comics history. And the example that I've been looking at most recently has been Alex Raymond's Flash Gordon uh, sci fi mm -hmm. comic from from the 30s. And, you know, I was just uh, glancing through stuff to, to understand it a bit better. And already, you know, you have the, you know, a, a, a whole universe of Flash Gordon appearing very, very quickly from the strips to the films to uh, toys, uh, products uh, to novelization. So that the the comic uh, inspiring a, a traditional novel. And so, you know, the example just confirms your point. And I suppose I'd just add that, you know, this is part of a, a commercial uh, popular culture industry uh, strongly associated with comics and that has a long history. I think that the only other point I'd say is, is in, in principle, the graphic novel shouldn't really be doing that quite so much. It, it should be behaving a little bit more like a, uh, you know, a, a traditional novel in that the author artist will have created it. There will be the reviews in the literary pages. Uh, there will be the readings, the book tour. Uh, but the uh, graphic graphic novels have tended to be because of their similarity to the literary space, not adapted or remediated quite so much. Uh, mm -hmm. You can find some very interesting films that have done it that tend to come into uh, kind of more American indie cinema. So Ghost World is an interesting filmic adaptation of Klaus's uh, graphic novel of the same title. And then I particularly like uh, American Splendor that uh, I think the film actually brings quite a lot more than the comic. So sometimes there can be a bonus when the uh, the story jumps into a, a different format. But in principle, uh, graphic novels don't remediate in quite such a commercialised venue because they're trying to seek a space in the literary fine art space rather than the uh you know mass media space so so actually this this uh, the split between the highlight fine arts and we'll come we'll circle back to it in a minute martha you, you have oh i just wanted to add one brief footnote to that uh because in the introduction Fun Home and Persepolis are mentioned, and both of those did have a little bit of an intermedial life. So Persepolis was made into a film, yeah. and Fun Home was made into a musical. So Fun Home first came out in 2006, and then in 2013, it was a very successful musical and won Tony Awards. And I actually had the opportunity to see a local production of Fun Home, yeah. which was fantastic and very moving. So in certain cases, there can be a little bit of intermediality, but I would agree with Hugo uh, on the whole, it's more artistic indie kind of engagements uh, rather than pop culture in the same way that the MCU operates. Universe, yeah. Uh, Fabrice, yes, yes. Well, and, and just to, to, to follow up with, with the same conversation, and I, I agree with both, both points, um, certainly drawn images are part of a, of a larger media scape, and clearly corporate entities have capitalized on, on merchandising opportunities, and you can have the same Star Wars um, products sold as a, as a, as a as an anime or as you know as, as, a, as a cartoon or as a tv series or or as a comic book or as a, a novelized uh, version there's all these these different ways of selling the same universe the same one and you also referred to um, similar situations like this uh, there's another way of looking at intermediality which is how a graphic novelist can can use um, other media w within within the, the drawn organic aspect of, of producing images and that's maybe referring to uh, redrawing photo uh, photographs uh, of alluding to, to to sound and music or, or art history and painting uh, and uh, I think that's the other side of intermediality which is more of a formal approach to to, to the medium uh, that is perhaps more prevalent 
in, in this original form in, in graphic novels. And you refer to Mouse, and of course, you know, is in Mouse, there are redrawn photographs, you know, and they, 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 they are uh, trying to look semi-photorealistic, but at the same time, they're part of the, the aesthetic of the whole volume, and there's a dialogue between superimposing drawn images with redrawn photographs. Uh, and it's it's a technique that uh, it tends to be used often in, in graphic novels. So it's a different, it's not a commercial use of intermediality. It, it is more of a, of a formal language that graphic novelists have developed, which refers to other art forms, so visual or sometimes not visual. You know, I think music is a good example of that. Also, it's, it goes to the point uh, that, um, or one of the points made in Benoit Crucifix's uh, The Arts, the drawing from the archives, because of course, these um, both comics and graphic novels produce uh, over time their own uh, archival reservoir of uh, techniques, you know, mm -hmm. techniques of the rhythm and so on and so forth. And these um, these th these archives become a different. It's a different archive from the archive of World War history for example, just randomly. Uh, but it's important because it, it, it allows then a kind of um, uh, best practices. So if, if you want to an early practitioner, so this is, this is a set of best practices that allowed X, this person to be successful or that person and so on. So what, what uh, Mahin, what do you make of this intermediality? Because of course, comics, uh, and I'm thinking of super, superhero comics, have had lots of mileage out of of this intermediality, but the, the but I want to you know, turn the question a little bit. What does this tell us about the popular cultural imaginary or imagination uh, in terms of the the speed at which um, the 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 uh, mediation? in different venues. What does it tell us about the state of popular culture? That's a big question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> state of popular culture today. Yeah, um, I, I think sometimes it's useful to think in terms of transmediality. When you, especially when you think of something like the MCU or any other um, popular culture product that exists across different media. So you have a comic, but you can also have um, novelizations around it. You can have films, you can use to have radio plays. Um, the, there's just so many different iterations of the same hero, story, and so forth. It, it kind of goes back to what you, you were talking about before, that there's this kind of pleasure in the familiar. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it, when you look at a newspaper comic and you, you, you kind of know what you expect and you get that and then you go on. So it's, it's a similar thing, right? Repetition, but with a very slight difference sometimes or not. But this is what the average popular culture reader wants. I think that's also what's connected to, you can also think of it in terms of genres. When you have romance, you have a certain formula that you expect will be followed. Sometimes it will be broken, but in any case, you, the satisfaction comes from adhering to the formula. So I, I think this a similar thing happens when you have these iterations across different media, it's, it's, it can, well, sometimes it's, it's less satisfying than other times, right? Say there are lots of fans who will criticize adaptations of films and so forth. But there, there, there is a fascination just to see a comic suddenly turning into a film or what well, before a radio play, or it, it's, it's always something new, but it's with the familiar material that sort of established this fandom or this base. Um, so it's also obviously a way of expanding audiences, giving giving existence, existing audiences what they want, but also potentially attracting newer audiences. So it's, and this is a very commercial enterprise. These these yeah these these um, producers want to grow. Yeah, I'm going to ask a different set of questions to do with the difference uh, in critical approaches to the novel novel. Jean Austen was mentioned in the graphic novel. But before that, let me, you know, do a, a small digression. 
Now, we are all terrified of the IKEA manual because it does have some graphic images, but it is not uh, orchestrated as a comic strip. I think the IKEA manual would be much more effective if they generated a comic strip on how to assemble a wardrobe or a bed. So I was thinking this is potentially a, an area that has not been explored because they do have figures, you know, holding a hammer or something, but somehow it's di disconnected. The figures are not completely connected to the tasks. And so consequently, the IKEA, assembling an IKEA piece of furniture is a nightmare. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I was thinking, okay, IKEA comic, uh, comic strips, maybe there's something there to be had. But the question I actually wanted to ask had to do with the differences in the criticism of the novel and the differences in in the uh, criticism, evaluation, critical evaluation, let's put it that way, the critical evaluation of the novel versus the critical evaluation of the, the uh, graphic novel and whether there are elements. For example, we all know of the, you know, narratologists, you know, mid 20th century, Roman Jakobson and so on. How might there be, and I'm thinking now of the uh, literature classroom, English department literature classroom, how might there be a transfer borrowing between both, both ways of uh, um, uh, 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 critical evaluations of the novel form and critical evaluations of the graphic novel form? Mm. Shall we start with uh, Fabrice? Um, it's an interesting question because I think I'm, I'm actually teaching this to my students next week. Um, that you know, when when I think of, of narratology or you know the, the the science of narrative, you know, and I think of, of formalists like Gérard Genet, you know, who did uh, Figures Number Three, uh, most of the concepts he identified for for storytelling can easily be transferred in a sense when you think about you know time frames, uh, you know flashback, flash forwards. When you think about the notions of voice, which is you know either subjective or objective types of narrative. Uh, most of these, these categories that apply to the novel um, have a, somewhat of an equivalent in the field of, of, uh, of graphic novels as well. So some, some easy transfers are, are possible in terms of terminology. What is more interesting, I think, is when, when um, formalists attempt to study the actual uh, form of the graphic novel itself without reference to literature. And there's several, you know, big names in this. Of course, you know, Scott McCloud did a book called Understanding Comics, which is drawn as a, as a comic book, and he, he discusses how you can transition from one panel to the next, for instance, different types of transitions. Um, the, I think the, the most uh, referred to book in this field is uh, Terry Grunstein's uh, Systems of, of Comics, which is a very, very uh, smart narratological or even stimulatic approach to, to the field of comics. Um, it does create a dialogue with literature, but also it focuses on what comics have in, in, that is specific to their language, uh, things that literature could not really replicate, you know, the, the art of braiding different time frames uh, and different geographic locations inside a single page by alternating panels uh, and, and creating these, these networks of meaning throughout a single page, for instance, uh, that's how, that of simultaneous understanding of, of a reality could not really be um, done with the, the with language in general or with, with the form of, of a novel. So there are interesting parallels between literature and, or the study of literature or the tools for studying literature and the tools for studying comics. Uh, a, a lot of them have parallels that are quite interesting. The, the, the more specific comic studies tend to also identify what comics can do or graphic novels can do with that literature or film are, are, could not really replicate um, because they have different languages. Mm, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Hugo. Uh, what um, you are looking reflective. It's a difficult question. It's a, <laughs> it's a, it's a difficult question. I think for, for me, I probably adopt a, a fairly similar approach to whatever cultural form I'm reading in the first instance. And that would be looking at the kind of underlying narrative rhetoric. And I'd probably do that for a a novel or a newspaper page or a, or a film and then basically I'd be you know it's a fairly autorist approach and trying to explore what the the creative mind or the creative team if you include filmmaking as a team or a publishing house in literature as a team you know what what in the end are these people trying to tell me 
and and then how are they telling it and then what does that mean for for the context of of today or the context of yesterday or the context of tomorrow so i guess i'm always looking at a kind of narratological approach that also accommodates the kind of ideology of the the text whatever it is and then you know what what what's the person trying to do how are they trying to persuade me to think one thing or think another thing or take that line or think in that approach and then contextualizing it to the the culture and the time it, it's produced and looking at other people who've copied it or deviated from it so a kind of comparative approach in context but that always goes back to the kind of what what's the ideological rhetoric of this cultural form and comics uh, comics are in you know visual storytellings in theory quite simplistic and you know in theory film can be very manipulative and you know play with your emotions maybe comics at comics similarly you know you'd think the traditional comic would be you know highly emotive you know the the romance comic or the war comic whereas maybe graphic novels or indie cinema or a, have got a, a different kind of perspective that are doing different things for for different audiences mm. uh, but it, it's interesting i was also going to mention that this there probably is some kind of overlap between contemporary graphic novels and contemporary uh you know writing so the kind of categories that the book the program era that's the kind of history of american creative mm. writing that by those colleague, by the way my colleague uh, yes mark my girl yeah no it's it's fascinating and you know not not my world but i read it and i think the graphic novels tends to replicate quite a lot of the tendencies that that he identified but in a in a completely different publishing mm -hmm. uh, milieu mm -hmm. so actually, a great question yeah i'll i'll the, the, actually just mentioning the program era also brings to mind a completely different question which is how are graphic novelists or comic um, you know um, writers comics how are they trained so the training of but i will show that for now uh, martha um, anything about um, novelistic discourse and evaluation of novelistic discourse and uh, of uh, graphic novels yeah i think the question of narrative voice is a great one um you know is this a distanced view or is it internal uh but i think that the addition of images makes it different sometimes the text will conflict with the image or ask you to question the image and i think that those moments are pretty interesting <clears throat> uh i think the graphic narratives that I'm most drawn to are ones that demand slow reading, which is to say you really need to stop and look at the interplay between text and image, look at the page layout, how is the page layout working, some panels are smaller, some panels are larger, there's a panel border or there isn't one, and this is also because I'm very interested in Chris Ware. I co-edited a book on Chris Ware. I don't know if you've ever seen his work, but the idea that graphic narrative is simple, you will change your mind once you take a look at Jimmy Corrigan or anything else that he's yeah. done. Uh, he has very complex diagrams that demand a lot of focused attention. Uh, and I think it's hard to to talk about his work using only terminology from literature studies uh, and that's why looking at layout and looking at um, tressage and braiding and, and all of these other concepts is actually quite important for the field of um, graphic mm -hmm. narrative mm -hmm. in, as a whole. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how about Mahin? Anything to add? Yeah, I I agree with with Martha, Fabrice, and Hugo. Um, I, I I think we. I, so usually we we teach I, I teach literature students, and I think that's the case for for most of us. And so it's quite it's it's, it's more intuitive to approach the graphic novel through the tools that the the students have already acquired, right? So they they're attuned to searching for meaning, looking for ambiguities and so forth. And 
what I try to emphasize alongside is the specific, the comic specific or the medium specific qualities that Martha and Fabrice and Hugo also mentioned, right? So the page layout, the style, what it does to the narrative, how it transforms it and how the graphic novel, but also comics in general are very self-conscious forms. So they're constantly aware of their meat, of the media that are connected to them, but also of themselves as a medium that seems to be very diagrammatic, right? Martha mentioned Chris Ware, who makes these very complex diagrams that oh, could be compared to an IKEA catalog. Yes. In a way, right? it's, <laughs> it's that kind of thing that seems simple, but the minute you start reading it, you realize it's very, very complex. But it's um it's a similar thing with comics. It, it, it is a very diagrammatic form, but it's it's a very complex object actually, which looks simple. This actually more um, complicated to both make, but also sometimes to unpack, obviously it depends on the comic or the graphic novel. Mm. So training, how are these um, graphic novelists, are there special, um, you know, of course everything is now on Google and his sister uh, YouTube, but that's not what I mean. I mean, are there institutions that think about these things that transmit, you know, the the archives and 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 practices and so on, and how would that creative training uh, be different from, say, a training in in writing poetry, for example, uh, where of course there's a particular you need to know about versification, the history of poetry, and so on. Are there training programs for graphic novelists? I'm assuming there are, but I have never thought of the question before, so that's what I'm asking now. Yes, Martha. Yes, um, there are a few, but not too many. I would say in the history of comics, it's mostly self-taught or people who might have come from art school. But back to the example of Chris Ware, he went to the Art Institute of Chicago and there he was very much discouraged from making representational art. So the kind of art he wanted to do with his cartooning was not what was encouraged by an MFA program. And ironically, he has since you know, he didn't finish and he's gone on to be kind of a, a superstar in comics, had a show at the Centre Pompidou in Paris and all of this uh, prestige. And he went back to the Art Institute of Chicago to teach a course on comics. So in a way, he kind of had his revenge. But um, but as far as uh, institutions, I would say the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont um, there's also a program that I'm currently taking called the Sequential Arts Workshop, which is based in Florida, but also does a lot online. Um, I think art schools might offer a little bit more in that, but there's not too many separate programs. It's more like people come through art school and maybe they want to specialize in that kind of work and maybe it's more accepted now but i would welcome others if they if they know more about that in europe of course there are schools like uh, the saint luc institute in brussels and i'm sure Mahin knows more about about some of those schools uh, european schools of cartooning but they are some prominent cartoonists have come from these programs so they are producing results in, in terms of training people to, to master the aesthetics of comics, you know, the, the, the artwork. Um, but I think typically, yes, it is sort of a self-taught. And it doesn't really take that much um, virtuosity, really. I mean, and that's one, one point that uh, someone like Scott McCloud makes in Understanding Comics, that you, you could do a comic book with very little technical ability. You can draw stick figures and still tell a story. Uh, it can be very ideogrammatic and very, very basic. It can also be very, very complex and very artistic and, and photorealistic. And there could be a lot of virtuosity is in there too. But, you know, technique is not always the the, the number one aspect of, of storytelling in comics. And some cartoonists have acknowledged their their technical flaws or technical limitations. Uh, you know, people like Alison Bechdel, who's... Uh, uh, you know, a very, very well-known uh, graphic novelist, you know, ha has publicly said in interviews that she, she didn't view herself as a, as a very proficient uh, uh, cartoonist in terms of the, the, the visuals of, of her work. Um, mm -hmm. 
but that's not really essential to uh, to to the field, you know, somehow. But I think people really do learn uh, technique through some of those programs. Any final thoughts to share with both the true religionists and just the curious uh, people? Uh, Hugo. Uh, yeah, maybe to go back to the uh, IKEA catalog analogy, you know, com comics, you know, it, it was very uh, clever and interesting one because, you know, you do have a history of uh, more or less comics as, uh, you know, public safety announcements, uh, informational material, you know, every time you go on a plane, that, that sort of thing in front of you could be a, you know, warning about what, what to do if the, you know, doors fall off, that kind of thing. So, you know, they've been used. Will Eisner, a uh, very important figure we, we haven't mentioned yet, uh, spent a lot of his career doing this for the, the US uh, Army in terms of safety manuals. And, and you know, across a kind of sociological approach, uh, it's kind of a lost realm of uh, kind of non-fiction, non-autobiographical, practical guidance books. There are also practical practical books on how to draw comics. And how to draw manga that's that's another kind of mm. uncharted territory mm. so uh it's such a rich you know i guess the to answer the real question is it's such a rich area i'd encourage everybody just to explore images you know wherever they are and think about what they mean yeah it just popped in my mind that the ministry of health japanese ministry of health typically issues a public health uh, uh, guidance is via manga because everyone reads manga so it's so it's it's so obvious when once you think about it so of course everyone has to be interested you go i completely agree with you explore images and drawings wherever you find them how about um, uh, martha yes Last. thank you um I was just reflecting on the chapter that I wrote um, on women and comics. And one point I wanted to make is that comics can become a really important forum for underrepresented groups or minoritized groups. So that in the history of comics, even in alternative comics, you didn't have too many women who were uh, invited or participating in the same way that, I don't know, Crumb would be, for instance, or Bill Griffith. And so you have the emergence of these counter narratives uh, through people like Trina Robbins, Diane Newman, um, and they are really providing a counterpoint to kind of the stereotypes and taboos around being a woman. Uh, and so I discovered, I kind of was able to think about and rediscover all of these people who are pushing the definition of what it means to be a woman, um, what that experience is like. And so these comics are very personal, very political, but also very intersectional. And I think that's exciting because we're getting to hear from voices we hadn't heard from in the mainstream. Um, in that image, we see uh, a Madonna and um, holding a cat, which is sort of this uh, parody of the Madonna and child. And uh, the author, Elliot Lady, is sort of making fun of art history there and, and showing other modes of being and also represents figures. There's um, a mother that was her mother, there's a punk figure that represents when they were uh, a teenager and then as genderqueer, as an adult, there's another figure. And what I liked about that image and why I got permissions for it is that it shows all these different types of women and ways of being a woman um, that I think exemplifies what's going on in the field. And I had begun my chapter with the um it's a broadside called resist which was published right after uh, the 2016 election and this was edited by francois mouly right who is um art spiegelman's wife but also the editor at the new yorker and it's this amazing compilation of comics by people who are well known and not so well known kind of protesting this moment where they felt that, <clears throat> you know, 
the election of Trump was really offensive to them and they wanted to speak out and express themselves. So uh, comics also have this potential as a political voice, right? And to present opposition. And so Resist Magazine had two issues, but that was what was so exciting about it was that it was very spontaneous. It had to be printed very quickly and it was distributed at the Women's March uh, in January of 2017, which I think was one of the largest marches in U.S. history. So again, I, the, I would underline the point that comics and graphic narrative has the ability to show these other perspectives that have been ignored previously and often oppositional perspectives, whether we're talking about race or gender or class. And in that sense, the medium is really democratized and, and leveled the playing field, allowing these new voices to come in. Um, also intermedi intermediately on Instagram, on the web, Etc. So that's why I find it an exciting time in comics. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, the, this point, uh, the final point that you made, is is uh, one of the key uh, points uh, in the American graphic novel. Uh, you know, Fabrice and Hugo. So it's, it's so Fabrice. Uh, did you also have some final thoughts? Um, well, I think I'm going to pick up a little bit of what everyone has said so far. But uh, I think what's interesting to me in in the graphic novel is that each work is a singular object and it, it could be a, a singular voice or a singular aesthetic or a singular message um, and in, in contrast to, to the uh, the predictability or, or the repeated patterns of, of all the comics which tended to be quite similar in in, in format and in style uh, you know without making too big of a generalization uh, so I, I do like the singularity of, of the graphic novel I think it's one of this this defining elements um, and actually trying to Put our finger on what is specific to, to each work is the difficult exercise for for scholars you know what what, what makes each of these works um, a very unique a very singular piece of piece of work and the other element and i think both uh, both martha and, and mahin have done great work on this it, i think is the emotional nature of the medium you know and there's something organic about but hand-drawn images, it, it emanates from from within, and it can also connect to to us in a very different way. We we, you know, as children, we have this connection with the medium. We know we when Mahin has worked on this a lot. Uh, we 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 all drew as as children. We 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 connected to drawn images from a personal standpoint, and so seeing them and 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 uh, getting into a dialogue with them is a very um, interesting channel for us to to deal with fiction or with. Uh, uh, or with with real stories, with real life stories. So both uh, the singular aspect of these works and then their emotional nature, their, their organic personal element to them are, are very compelling uh, characteristics of the graphic novel to me. Yeah, and also I, I some years ago, I started giving my children for Christmas graphic novels because I was frustrated that they were not reading <laughs> reading enough you know which of course as a professor of literature they will never read enough for my but i started giving them graphic novels and they were reading them you know i just went to the bookstore i went to the graphic novel section I, blah, 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 and i gave them and that um, instigated their reading so also uh, a point to note is that it's good to uh, because we, we we learn to draw as children we read comics as children but then somehow as we grow older many people ignore them but actually there's a whole world of, of pleasant reading and informational reading to be had in graphic narratives yeah so thank you very much so um this uh, thank you so much for for me a most enlightening uh, conversation and i think our our listeners will also be extraordinarily uh, stimulated so thank you all so so much thank you yeah. thank you Abba. thank you thank you, yeah. thank you.